Hey everyone, welcome back. Today we'll go through another high yield USMLE practice question. This one particularly relevant for all three steps, one, two, and three. And then at the end, we'll conduct a review of the brachial plexus and some brachial plexus lesions that you may see show up frequently on NBME exams. So we'll go ahead and get started. A three hour old newborn male born via vaginal delivery developed changes in his left arm. Delivery was noted to be complicated with shoulder dystocia. He is a term newborn delivered at 39 weeks and born at 4,600 grams with APGAR scores of eight and 10 respectively. Vital signs include a temperature of 37 and a pulse of 130. Examination shows a well appearing infant with a normal appearing right upper extremity and a left upper extremity in adduction and internal rotation. His right hand appears normal, but his left hand maintains inflection at rest. Which of the following is most likely injured in this patient? We have the upper C5, C6 trunk, the lower trunk, posterior cord, the long thoracic nerve, the ulnar nerve, or the lateral cord. I'll pause here briefly to give you a chance to think through this. Okay, so we'll go ahead and cross through the wrong answers here and talk about why each answer is wrong, and then we'll conclude with a review of the brachial plexus and some high yield information. So right off the bat, we know that this is a shoulder dystocia situation, and we know that both A and B, upper and lower trunk lesions, are common in shoulder dystocia. So right off the bat, you would be suspicious that A and B may be what you're looking for here, but we can work through all the other answers at the same time. So you also not only need to know that the shoulder dystocia can either come out with the neck sort of cranked upwards or the shoulder pulled upwards, which can cause an upper or lower trunk lesion respectively, but any of these other lesions could happen. You just need to think through the pathology that you're seeing here on exam. So we'll cross through the first here. So right off the bat, we know that the lower trunk and the ulnar nerve would look pretty similar. The lower trunk turns into the medial cord, which turns into the ulnar nerve. So we know that lesions of these two would look pretty similar. They're not perfectly exclusive. There are things in C8 and T1 that aren't in the ulnar nerve. But right off the bat, if you look at the extremity here, you have an extremity in adduction and internal rotation and the hand inflection. So if you remember, B and E both would the appearance of it would look like claw hand, which is a true ulnar or medial cord lesion, where the hand itself is stuck in a claw-like appearance um, due to weakness of the intrinsic hand muscles like the lumbar pulls. So we know right off the bat that B is commonly seen in shoulder dystocia, but not in this particular situation. And we can talk more about what the, these lesions look like later. So we know those two aren't the correct ones so far. And then we get to long thoracic nerve. So remember long thoracic nerve comes from C5 through C7 and innervates the serratus anterior. And the high, high yield thing to know about the long thoracic nerve is you look for scapular winging. This can happen in um, what previously were total mastectomies where the long thoracic nerve would be injured. We know this is clearly not this, but it's another high yield brachial plexus lesion they like to throw in. Next, we have the posterior cord. We know the posterior cord gives off both the axillary and radial nerve. Um, axillary responsible for a duction, which is impaired here, but there's some other things, including the, basically the hand, the arm straightened and the left hand inflection that makes you think that this isn't just the axillary. And the radial would be quite a distractor in this setting too, because the radial would be responsible for things like wrist extension. So we know C is out as well. So now we're between A and F, the upper trunk and the lateral cord. And it's tricky because the upper trunk does turn into the lateral cord, which makes you think, how do you tell the difference between these two? if they gave this to you. Well, the trick lies in what is proximal to the lateral cord that's only found in the upper trunk. And the answer to that would be the suprascapular nerve. And the suprascapular nerve innervates what's important for this question, the supraspinatus. And the supraspinatus is responsible for the abduction, the deficit that you're seeing, and why the left upper extremity is stuck in adduction. It's unopposed ad adduction because the abduction from the supraspinatus is impaired. If it was just the lateral cord, which turns into the musculocutaneous nerve, you would just have the arm extended and, and potentially an internal rotation, but you wouldn't have the problems with abduction. So now we know we've ruled out the lateral cord and we're left with an upper C5, C6 trunk lesion. So we know the high yields here are shoulder dystocia. Keep in mind, subtle hints include the weight of this baby. 4,600 grams is greater than the 4,500 macrosomic threshold. And then also just keep in mind the appearance of the extremity to not confuse you with the lower trunk lesion. A deduction, internal rotation, and the hand is also stuck in flexion. So now let's talk through how you would 
localize a brachial plexus lesion in any sort of question that they give you. The first step I always recommend is to visualize or draw the brachial plexus. So for this, this exam and on board exams, you may not have time to draw the whole thing out. So it may be simpler to just picture it in your head. So picture the C5 through T1 roots turning into the cords. And then most importantly, what nerve do they turn into and what do those nerves do? And from there, if you just keep in mind the basics, you can identify which muscle is dysfunctional at that point based on what nerve is, is affected. From there, you connect each affected nerve to the muscle that it innervates. And now you're starting to see what dysfunction is present. And so in the question, it may give you the nerve that's impaired, but the physical exam will show you what muscle is actually impaired. And then the last step, step four, is determining if it's just a simple nerve problem or if it's a combination problem like a trunk, like an upper trunk in this case, which was C5, C6. So here we have a picture of the brachial plexus to go over just the basics. So you have each vertebral level here, pictured here with each root coming out with the cervical roots coming out above the respective vertebral level. And so let's talk briefly about the various nerves in the brachial plexus and how they can be tested. We'll touch on some of these others briefly and we'll touch on the higher yield ones in more depth. So I'll kind of highlight some of the nerves here. So keep in mind that you have the roots which turn into the trunks and then divisions, which are not as high yield for the exams, the cords, and then the final terminal branches. So, and along this path, you have some individual nerves that kind of branch off. So we talked about the suprascapular nerve. This branches off on the superior trunk or the upper trunk prior to the division of the lateral cord. So this innervates the supraspinatus, which is responsible for abduction. And so that's why an upper trunk lesion causes impaired abduction. As we continue on, we have the lateral pec nerve here, which innervates the pectoralis major, and then it turns into the musculocutaneous nerve. This innervates the biceps, which is responsible for flexion of the arm at the elbow and supination. So if you remember from this question, the impaired function was flexion of the elbow. So the arm was extended. It was internally rotated because the arm was in, unable to supinate. And then it was pinned against the, against the abdomen because it was unable to abduct. So you can use these nerves and these muscles to determine that this was a C5, C6 upper trunk lesion and not just have to memorize the, the palsy itself. Other important nerves we have here, we have long thoracic, like I talked about, comes from C5 through C7. It sits on the lateral rib cage, innervates the serratus anterior, which would sit just on top of the ribs, and it's responsible for the pinning of the shoulder blade as the shoulder is used. And so lesion of this causes wing scapula, which you'll see in, like I said, total mastectomies and especially radical mastectomies in the old days. Um, and then we have the rest of these nerves here, which we can go over in detail. Um, thoracodorsal is important, innervates, innervates the latissimus dorsi, um, many of these others. So upper subscapular innervates the subscapularis, lower subscapular innervates the teres major. We know some of these are responsible for the rotator cuff muscles, but these are less likely to come up in board style question. So we'll move on to now the higher yield brachial plexus lesions that were in the last question. So we have the superior trunk lesion. We talked about that. That's what's called Herb Duchenne palsy. We continue on to the lateral cord, turns into the musculocutaneous nerve. You would have a biceps lesion here. So it would look similar to an upper trunk lesion, except you would spare the supraspinatus involvement, which we already talked about. The axillary nerve is innervates the deltoid muscle. So you'd have impaired abduction and you would also lose sensation over the deltoid, which we did not have in that question. And common injuries um, would include surgical neck fractures, anterior shoulder dislocations as the axillary nerve is oftentimes just in front of the shoulder joint. So as the shoulder dislocates anteriorly, it hits the axillary nerve. Then we have the radial nerve, which travels through the spiral groove of the humerus and innervates the triceps muscle. So the exact opposite would be present if it was proximal to the innervation of the triceps, you would have an ability to extend and you'd have the, the arm stuck in flexion. But what you commonly more see is the radial nerve is, is affected distally to the triceps innervation. So you predominantly see problems with wrist extension because the radial nerve is also responsible for wrist extension, as well as the dorsum proximal three digits here of the hand. So you can see sens sensory loss in this area as well. The median nerve, you can see lesioned in supracondylar humerus fractures. And so you'd have weakness 
in the lateral three fingers, as well as weakness in the thumb and the thenar muscle. So you may see atrophy in the three thenar distribution. You can also have this occur in carpal tunnel syndrome, which early on is more of a numbness sensory changes and pro can progress to a true median nerve lesion. And then we also have the ulnar nerve, which is the continuation of C8 to T1, turns into the medial cord, turns into the ulnar nerve. This innervates the medial two digits. So these would have been affected. And as well as it, not only does it control the medial two digit sensation, but it also controls some of the intrinsic muscles for the entire hand. So the lumbricals are responsible for flexion here at the MCP joint. So when this is impaired, you have extension here like this hand, but then you also have when the intrinsic muscles of the hand atrophy, you have flexion at the DIP and PIP joint. And so you have what's what looks like the claw hand. And the same thing can happen in Klumpke palsy, which is an inferior or lower trunk lesion. We talked about how those can look similar to ulnar nerve lesions. Um, you typically have to use the type of injury that they give you to differentiate these, as opposed to C5, C6 trunk versus musculocutaneous. It has a specific nerve that comes off here that helps you differentiate. So for example, lower trunk lesion would be from an arm being pulled upwards. So if you picture this being the arm, this being the neck, if the arm is stretched upwards, you would have the stretching of the lower trunk, which can happen in a shoulder dystocia complicated birth. Somebody, the picture of somebody falling from a tree and hanging on and their arm being stretched, that would cause a lower trunk lesion versus an ulnar nerve lesion could happen in the cubital tunnel at the elbow. It could happen in Guyon's canal, which is just here proximal to the hand. So that can be hard to tell apart just based on the presentation. So last year, I have a summary slide of some of the high yield lesions that we've talked about. And we have the trunks on the left and the branches on the right. Keep in mind that there's also divisions, there's cords, um, but these are typically the highest yield that they like to test because they're well characterized. So we have the upper trunk on the left here. It's called herb Duchenne palsy. We talked about the muscles that are affected, the supraspinatus, the deltoid, and the biceps, um, which causes many of the symptoms that we saw. And so the lesion, as you can picture here, is the waiter's tip hand. The arm is internally rotated, it's pinned in adduction against the body, and then the hand is stuck in flexion as well. So that, that's the waiter's tip hand. Then the lower trunk lesion we talked about here is called clumpy, clumpy palsy. The muscles affected are the intrinsic hand muscles, so the lumbricals are affected, which causes extension at this joint. And as the muscles here in the intrinsic hand muscles atrophy, you cause flexion and clawing of the digits here as well. You may see in early lesions that the lesion particularly spares these two early on and then kind of progresses. So then we talk about the branches here. So the musculocutaneous nerve, we know innervates the biceps and brachialis, impaired flexion and forearm supination. So it looks a lot like the upper trunk lesion, but keep in mind, you won't have the problems with the abduction because you're not, you're sparing the deltoid and the supraspinatus. This can happen with trauma. It's not a common lesion on exams, but it can happen. We talked about the radial nerve. The muscles ex affected are the wrist extensors typically because the radial nerve typically gets hit at the mid shaft of the humerus, which is distal to where the triceps innervate. So you can have wrist drop. You can also have loss of sensation on the dorsal part of the first three fingers. So this can happen in mid shaft fractures or if someone's using crutches and it's compressing the nerve on the backside of the arm. The axillary nerve innervates the deltoid, which we talked about would cause abduction problems, and it, as well as loss of sensation on the deltoid. That's very specific to the axillary nerve. And this can happen in anterior shoulder dislocation or surgical neck fractures of the humerus. The median nerve, we know, provides um, innervation of the thenar muscles. So as the thenar muscles weaken, um, you can sometimes have what's called benediction sign, which is you ask people, someone to flex their fingers and the medial two fingers are able to flex okay, but these three aren't. And so you get what looks like, if you've ever seen the Pope do the benediction sign, that's what that looks like because of weakness of the muscles innervated by the median nerve. And we talked about supracondylus humor, humerus fractures being the high yield pathology there. And then last but not least, we have the ulnar nerve, which looks a lot like the lower trunk because it comes from the lower trunk and is innervated by the same nerve. So the intrinsic hand muscles causes the ulnar claw hand, which is pictured here. But keep in mind that earlier on, these muscles may not be affected and these two fingers may not be affected as much as the medial two fingers. So we talked about the cubital tunnel in the medial part of the elbow can be compressed. The hook of handmate 
in the medial part, just proximal to the hand. And then in cycling, as you compress the ulnar tunnel in this area against the handle of the bicycle. Those are common lesions that the ulnar nerve is affected. So keep in mind, there are other lesions, and this is simplifying these for the sake of exams, but this is the best way to think about some of these lesions. Picture the plexus, understand the nerves, what's innervated, and, and remember the lesions, rather than just memorizing specific syndromes with no basis, because they can potentially ask you the underlying cause of the syndrome and not just the syndrome itself. So like and subscribe if you found this video helpful, and we'll be sure to do more like this in the future.